Thank you, Vivek. Um, excellent. Well, I'm super excited to see so many people that I know here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, since we're just coming back from lunch, I wanted to um, start with a couple of quick questions. So first of all, who here um, has played a game in the last month? OK. Who here um, considers themselves as any type of creative? Music, visual, anything. OK, great. So this is, this is a good amount of the room. Who here, um, other than voting, has participated in municipal or county government or democracy in the last year? OK, pretty good. Pretty good for the crowd. Who, um, who did before the age of 25? Less, but some. Good. So we have a unique sample in this room, but generally, <laughs> but generally, uh, that's uh, participating in democracy, particularly local democracy, is something that um, a lot of people don't come around to doing until uh, later in life. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about is how we can use games to engage more, especially young people, um, with local uh, local government and local democracy. And so. I come at this from a, um, a background in uh, education and nonprofits. Um, I studied media production and uh, games and learning in undergrad at the University of Wisconsin. I then spent about 10 years working in um, all different kinds of capacities, doing curriculum development, game and story-based um, learning, especially in the maker education space. And um, for me, um, after the 2016 election, I really found myself questioning whether I was in the right space. I went back to Wisconsin, which is where I'm from, and I had been doing a whole bunch of interviews with people there, people on the right and the left, um, trying to understand what was happening with this severe polarization in our, in our country, even among my family. And uh, that really, looking into that problem, really brought me to an, a new awareness of this, that so we have a crisis of civic literacy and engagement in this country. Um, in 2016, the United States was the first time, for the first time downgraded from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. And I think that a big part of this has to do with our civic education system. Um, in the United States, in an assessment of um, standards in 32 states and Washington, D.C., um, it was found that no states have experiential learning or local problem-solving components in their civics requirements. Um, and again, that's all of the states they looked at, including Wisconsin. Um, so that experiential learning with civics may happen, but it's not required. Um, so it's really, you know, this is just the beginning of the problem because a 2016 Annenberg study found that only 26% of Americans can name all three branches of government. We have a really big problem. Um, and this is at, at, the, at the federal government level. Um, that doesn't even touch on what happens in local and county government, who your city representatives are, what a municipal resolution is, um, what a county referendum is. None of that stuff is taught in school in most states. Uh, so again, um, I'm from Wisconsin. Wisconsin, I will be bringing up multiple times uh, because this is where I conducted most of my research. I spent a lot of the last year looking at civic engagement practices in central Wisconsin, uh, particularly in smaller cities. And the organization I worked most closely with um, is called Wisconsin United to Amend. Um, they're a small social movement organization. Um, they're based in Madison, but they work all over the state. And they're working on the issue of money and politics. And uh, what their goal is, is to get a 28th Amendment to the Constitution that addresses, um, addresses this issue. And in Wisconsin, um, campaign finance and the role of money in politics became a particularly big issue in 2012. Um, so I understand if you don't all follow Wisconsin politics, so I'll give you a quick little recap here. Um, in 2012, uh, protesters were able to demand a recall election of our, of our then governor, Scott Walker. Um, if you may remember, this was, this was in the news quite a bit. There were tons of protests, tons of people um, taking action on this. That recall election did not succeed. And part of the reason for that is that Scott Walker uh, and his campaign was able to raise $30 million um, from primarily out-of-state donors, including up to $19 million that came from um, Coke-backed uh, organizations. 
whereas his opponent only raised $4 million, primarily from in-state donors. Uh, there's this huge issue in terms of the role that money plays um, in our government locally in Wisconsin and throughout the country. And of course, there's all kinds of other issues that we face. Um, the, uh, you know, Wisconsin got a D in their state integrity report in 2015. Um, there's a lot that people could be organizing around. Um, but in a lot of places, it's not happening. But in Madison, there's some interesting things that are happening. Um, and that is that even in the midst of this really frustrating political moment of this 2012 recall election, uh, we had things like this. Uh, this is the Imperial Walker uh, referencing Star Wars. Um, this was a costume that showed up around the recall elections in 2012. Um, they actually would rock, walk around yelling, the Imperial Walker never stops. Um, and it was really, uh, it was really popular um, among protesters. It was something that other people started to copy. Uh, you know, memes were created, stickers were printed. It became part of the movement. Uh, and it was fun. It was something that was fun. And that's what I want to talk about and focus on quite a bit um, in, in, in this talk, is um, how we can connect people to the fun of movements and how games might be able to help us do that as a way to onboard people into taking more civic action. <clears throat> so um, my focus was specifically on grassroots organizing at the municipal and the county level. Um, and what I argue is that um, we need to be looking more closely at this field of participatory engagement. Um, which is sort of the overlap of participatory culture, um, which many people are probably familiar with in terms of Henry Jenkins' work, and civic engagement. Uh, and what I'm going to argue is that games can be a key part of how we bring these things together. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to go over a few things here. Um, first, I'll talk about my research. The second two sections are some of my findings. And then finally, I'm going to talk about uh, the game that I've been developing over the last year as part of my thesis work uh, to address this problem in Appleton, Wisconsin. So first of all, research. Um, my main research question, which I was surprised in looking over all of my different presentations of these thesis ideas um, to see like that this actually kind of followed through a little bit. Um, it is how might nonprofits and social movement organizations leverage the principles of game based learning and game design thinking to increase civic engagement and civic literacy. And so there's kind of four different subparts of this that I was thinking about. Um, one of it is I was really uh, looking spe specifically at location based games and thinking about how the affordances of that type of game can support um, local action. Uh, I was thinking about um, how the idea of participatory futurism or the ways that different people can come together to think about the future in a more positive light could play a role. I was doing a lot of work looking at the existing tools that support um, both social movement organi organizations and activists. Um, and then, like I said, I really wanted to focus on um, places outside of the large urban centers. I think there's a lot of work, especially in the civic innovation and technology space around places like Chicago and Boston. Um, and I was curious about what was happening in you know, a 70,000 person city in the middle of Wisconsin, all the way down to a 2,000 person city. So first, um, these are some of the things that I pulled from um, for my, my literature review. Um, I looked a lot at social movement studies, particularly um, looking at creative activism and youth activism. Um, also looked at the field of civic media and location-based media. And then finally, I pulled a lot from um, the games and learning field. And again, this is more of my, my background, what I was familiar with coming in. Um, and it was really useful to kind of frame some of the other things that I was learning. In terms of primary research, uh, first I did a lot of ethnographic research. Uh, I did 15 interviews, tons and tons of calls, four community um, design sessions, and a survey in Wisconsin. Uh, and then I also did a bunch of design-based research, um, which included four public library installations and then 10 iterations of the game that I've been working on. Uh, so these are just some of the pictures of all of that. Uh, this was the biggest installation that was in Appleton last summer. Um, some of you recognize this, and I forced you to play test it last year. Um, <clears throat> so I'll go into a little bit more of that. Uh, so uh, findings. 
Um, the first big piece that I was starting to notice was that there's this um, difference between participatory and institutional forms of engagement. And what I really pulled from, um, and when I started thinking about this, was this 2012 piece from Bennett and Segerberg uh, called The Logic of Connective Action. Um, and they argue that connective action functions differently than more traditional collective action. Well, the logic of collective action emphasizes uniform framing and the function of SMOs as the dominant organizing bodies. The logic of connective action suggests that digital media are also strong organizing structures. I'm sorry, SMOs means social movement organizations. Um, so they say, when people who seek more personalized paths to concerted action are familiar with the practices of social networking in everyday life, and when they have access to technologies from mobile phones to computers, they're already familiar with a different logic of organization, the logic of connective action. And this is also reflected in the, use, uh, the research that's been done by the Youth Participatory Politics uh, Research Network on how youth engage with, um, with politics. And Kathy Cohen has really been a leader in this work. Um, in her research, she talks about these two different types of political engagement, institutional and participatory. Um, and this really reflects these overall changes we're seeing in the world in terms of how our, our phones and our connectivity change pretty much everything. This is how it works for particularly youth in the civic space. So I'm gonna really, really uh, simplify, overly simplify this uh, to take you through what these mean. Um, first, institutional um, engagement. Uh, I have my bring on the fundraising emails here. Uh, institutional engagement is kind of your traditional approach to digital organizing that a lot of social movement organizations pursue. Uh, it's really driven by the idea of the marketing funnel. Um, it's top down, there's only a few calls to action. It doesn't do a good job supporting local action. Um, they're just like, let's push all this stuff out and then hopefully we'll get a few people to make a donation. Uh, and I actually looked, was looking at my emails from all the organizations that I follow in Wisconsin. And in the month of November, over, let's see, I think it was fi over 55% of them, the only call to action was to donate. And I, w I wanted to just have like a response to be like, I'm a grad student, no. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, we've got participatory engagement. Um, this is very different, typically more popular among younger people. Uh, and this is much less like a funnel and more like a ladder that uses popular culture to onboard people into movements. And uh, one of the organizations that Henry Jenkins writes a lot about in, in this space is called the Harry Potter Alliance, which basically uses the fictional world of Harry Potter to get people engaged in politics all over the world. And there's a few different features of this participatory engagement that, that I kind of identified in looking at a lot of the work on this space. Uh, first, these um, forms of engagement tend to be remixable. Um, they tend to be very diverse, so it could be a really complicated, difficult thing, it could be a really easy thing, um, and there's a lot of different ways to engage. Um, they tend to be modular, which means like that Imperial Walker costume, I can look at a picture of that and I can find a way to replicate that. Um, and potentially repurpose it for different causes. Uh, and they're also personalizable. Um, so I can kind of put my stamp um, and use it as a way to express something about who I am. And so I think overall in organizing, we really need both of these appro uh, approaches. Um, we need both those, like these funnels and these ladders uh, because we live in a diverse world and we need diverse ways to engage. Um, but what I've seen is that right now, in the um, technology space, there are very, very few tools that support more participatory forms of engagement. Um, so I did an analysis of over 20 different tools that are used um, both by existing social movement organizations and by activists. And I generally just found that a lot of these technologies um, are, are very one way. They, again, focus on a limited set of calls to action. They're just generally not aligned with this um, more participatory form of engagement. <clears throat> and so overall, in looking at the tools that exist in this space, I kind of noticed these three trends. One is that very, very few of them, if any of them, really support local action um, at the municipal and the county level. The second is there's not a ton of collaboration that is supported in these tools. Um, usually an organization will maybe put together an app to support their cause, um, but then they don't end up getting a lot of users and it's not maintained very well and all of these other issues happen and, and it just kind of ends up getting ignored. Uh, and 
be, by being collaborative, I think that you can, um, I'll talk about this more, but you can get more people involved and you can do a better job supporting the technology. And then finally, uh, just what I've been talking about, they're not particularly participatory. So the next section, I'm going to look at uh, educational game design and how we can um, use it as a tool to drive more of this type of participatory engagement. So the first thing here is um, I talk uh, in, the, in the thesis a lot about the idea of game design thinking. Um, and this is my definition of game design thinking, an approach to the design of civic technology that uses the structure of a game to model complex social problems in a way that makes them easier for community members to under understand and engage with. Um, this is different from other definitions. Um, both uh, Ben Stokes and Eric Gordon um, use this idea in slightly different ways uh, that I think are also very useful, but this is kind of how I, how I was using it. How do we use games to think about the complex structure of the social movement field and make it easier to understand how you can plug in? So um, this is really uh, essentially the second chapter <laughs> of my thesis, and it's organized around the Resonant Games um, framework, uh, which is in Resonant Games, which is uh, from the Education Arcade here. And they identify these kind of four principles of, um, of learning, uh, learning games. And they are honor the whole learner, honor the sociality of learning and play, the deep connection between content and game, and the learning context. So I'm just going to very briefly go through each of these, the sections in this chapter, a couple of the takeaways that I found, certainly not in, uh, everything. Um, so first of all, I, I rephrase this one as play and learning. How do we look at the connection between the content and the game? Um, and in Resonant Games, they say, if you're asking, how do I make this topic fun, you're asking the wrong question. What you really want to do is try to find what's already fun about a particular process and then connect players to that. So when I was thinking uh, about social movements, again, this pulls me back to this idea of creative activism. What is already fun about taking part in a grassroots movement? Um, and then the other thing um, in this part that I wanted to highlight is uh, the idea of scaffolding. Um, so you know, in, in learning theory, we would talk about the zone of proximal development, which is basically how do we keep people kind of just at the edge of their comfort zone? Uh, so that they can, can be continually learning through an exper experience. And what I've seen in a lot of um, the particularly digital forms of, of uh, websites for participating with large social movement organizations is that they don't really scaffold engagement very well a lot of the time. Um, as one example, you might go on, you might say, I'm interested, and they'll ask you to tweet something as the first step. You're like, okay, I can, I can do that. And then after that, it says, you know, next step, and uh, the next step is start a local chapter, <laughs> which is like this massive ask, right? It's like, find other people. There's nothing in between. And I think that this idea of, of scaffolding, even if it was just this alone, could be really helpful in designing civic technologies that can support that type of engagement. Second, um, I talk about identity and expression. Um, this kind of... Uh, speaks to the idea that learners are not you know, an empty vessel. Um, we al already have things that we know, um, and we need to be able to build off and connect to those things. Uh, and uh, there's, there's four pieces here. Um, the first is we need to make personal expression a mechanism of achieving the desired engagement goal. Again, for in my case, I think this relates to creative activism. Second, um, contribution creates ownership and belonging. Um, so Sasha talks a lot about this in their book um, on transmedia organizing and talking about how creating a, you know, a video or telling your story through some form of media really increases your sense of connection to a particular movement. Third, um, I think participatory culture very well fits in with this. How do we personalize what we're sharing and what we're doing? And then finally, um, we need to support spreadability. So you can't just build for one platform. It's got to be able to, things have got to be able to be shared. Next, collaboration and community. Uh, this is another thing that I think we could really learn from when we look at civic technologies in general, but specifically for the organizing space. Um, and there's, again, four things here. Uh, the first is we need to support reputation and reciprocity, um, so the ability for people to engage and build relationships over time. Um, be affirmative with low barriers to entry. Um, it's pr pretty self-explanatory. Um, promote peer learning and training, uh, and promote collaboration. Uh, so the, the two key points here are with collaboration, um, 
again, this kind of speaks to that logic of connective action. How do we create tools that can support a large number of issues and causes um, and enable people to connect and say, hey, like, you know, I follow 350.org because I care about climate change, but I didn't know about like the Sunrise Movement and all of these other things that I might also be doing. Um, and in terms of peer learning, uh, when I was an undergrad, I studied with um, Constance Steinkohler, who does a lot of work on World of Warcraft and how people in the game of World of Warcraft learn from and teach each other. And there's a really, there's really interesting customs that exist in that game and in many other games uh, that can show us how players, uh, more advanced players, can be mentors for new players. And I think that there's also something to that that could be really useful for an experience um, for onboarding people into the, the space of organizing. And then finally, strategy and context. Again, honor the learning context. Um, so uh, first, um, this really, for me, is what got me to start thinking about location-based games as a useful medium for, for the problem I was looking at, um, because they promote habits of connection to place. And what I mean by that um, is really demonstrated well in research on the game called Mogi, which was the precursor to Pokemon Go. Um, and what the researchers found in looking at players of that game is that the players will actually, like, throughout the course of their day, change where they go uh, in order to interact with different sites in the game. And when I started playing Pokemon Go, uh, I noticed that I was doing the same thing. They're like, oh, that statue outside the lab. Like, I got to stop by there. I'm not going to go this way because I want to play over here. And I think there's something about that like visual cue of a space that you see that could be really useful for a civic engagement game, especially if it's focused on local issues, um, which also relates to the idea of situating learning and engagement. So if there's something I want you to know about the library, can I put that information at the library? And then finally, in this section, I also thought a lot about knowledge games and specifically crowdsourcing. So one of the big challenges of you know, information systems at the local level is there's tons and tons and tons of local elected representatives. Uh, so are there ways that we can build it into the game to actually um, collect information about who holds those positions and what their stances are on different issues? What information do we need to know at the local level? And uh, can we incentivize um, play around learning that? So, <laughs> thinking about all of that, I'm going to just spend a couple minutes here taking you through um, the game itself, which is called Forward. Um, again, this was built for the city of Appleton, Wisconsin. It's a 75,000 person city um, that's just a little bit south of Green Bay. Uh, it tends to be pretty conservative, although there's an interesting mix of organizations there. Uh, and first, I just want to touch a little bit on, on Wisconsin context. So. I think that when we think of Wisconsin, there are certain things that come to mind, which are all very well represented on our state quarter. Uh, we have a cow, and we have cheese, and we have corn. But uh, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that our state motto is forward. And Wisconsin has a really strong uh, tradition of, of organizing, of activism, and of, of progressive uh, ideas. And this isn't typically reflected in, in a lot of our politics in the state today, but it's something that uh, I'd like to be able to remind people of. Um, and so that's kind of why I chose this name forward, um, is thinking, and, and, and also because I want people to actually think forward, think about the future um, as a way to kind of get past our more partisan barriers. So forward is a, uh, a location-based civic engagement game that connects activists with action alerts called missions based on their interests, skills, availability, and location. Now, throughout the game, players collect elements to complete missions with other players in support of local causes, and completing these missions allows players to submit and vote on headlines about the state's future. So this is gonna, we're gonna be launching a pilot of this. Um, it's gonna be five weeks on a, on a web app, um, starting on July 4th. So wish me luck in building that over the next month. Um, and the hypothesis is that games can facilitate structured, cross-moving collaboration between organizations and their supporters, thereby increasing both issue awareness and personalization of calls to action at the local level. 
And so first I wanted to define what are some of my goals in creating this experience. The number one goal is to promote creative activism. I want to expand how people think about civic engagement. So if I can get somebody to do one piece of chalk art or make one meme and tag it in a location in the city, like I consider that a win. Uh, other things, of course, are just about learning about local government and local civics. Um, and then again, thinking positively about the future, shifting the frame of how we're thinking about these issues. So the game's story um, is that we are trying to collaboratively write a futuristic edition of the local paper for May 29th, 2048, which is Wisconsin's 200th birthday. Uh, and the way this works is that uh, as you play the game, negative headlines, which are sourced, um, crowdsourced from the community, uh, show up. And then you have to counteract them as a player by putting in positive headlines. And you've got to get enough likes on your positive headlines that they beat out the negative ones. So the first step when you join this game is you actually create a little avatar. This is part of that identity formation and expression piece. Something that we actually found was really, really popular in paper prototyping. Um, this is a little avatar card that one of the early players filled out. And we randomly picked this like aesthetic of these cute little animals with like superhero stuff, like superhero costumes. And um, I just kind of like continued going with that because people seem to like it. Um, and so this is kind of the over the uh, mock-up sort of promo thing of the game. Um, you're trying to run around and collect these different elements, um, and it's all uh, it's all place-based. So the different components of the game itself. Um, first, uh, we have tactics. Tactics are templates for creative civic engagement. So if anybody's familiar with Instructables, I really like the way that they do this. Um, step by step, how did you create your Imperial Walker? You know, what materials did you need? Uh, and I want to start with about 50 different tactics in the game, and then participants can also add their own. Um, and those tactics exist in three different categories, um, which are guided by our three little um, player characters here. Uh, we've got the Honey Badger for advocacy, the Dragon Pug for creative, and Nerdicorn for research. Um, so these represent different types of uh, tactics that you can engage with, and you can level up in each of these categories as you go through the game. Uh, next, campaigns. Um, so this is kind of what you think of. What are local organizations trying to achieve? Um, I'm going to be sourcing these campaigns from a minimum of 15 different organizations. Uh, and uh, I just want to know, you know, are you trying to get a, you know, get a certain number of um, signatures on a petition, uh, pass a local resolution? What tangibly are you trying to succeed or achieve? And how can our players, um, through creative activism, support that? Um, so missions are how they do that. Uh, missions combine a tactic and a campaign. Uh, and enable people to, to run out into the community and, and do something to raise awareness about that thing. Um, it could be uh, something that you see somebody doing, like actually dressing up or doing a flash mob. Um, or it could be just them digitally tagging um, and geolocating a, a, a digital piece of media for other players to find, um, which that'll be part of the test to see what, what works with that. Um, stories just document the completion of missions. Those are the things that you like in order to get points for the headlines. Um, which, of course, is how you influence the overall uh, story. And again, I want this to be something that can serve multiple organizations. These are the five different issues um, that the game looks at. And so we'll be working with um, hopefully a minimum of three organizations on each of these issues to define um, the sort of pre initial set of missions. And you can also do team play. I won't get into how that works, <laughs> but teams of five to 10 people are supported to hopefully um, see if, if that's something that other people enjoy doing. Uh, and so with that, I just want to say thank you, um, first of all, to um, Scott and Sasha, my thesis advisors, um, to you know, Wisconsin United to Amend, all the people that I worked with in Wisconsin, the city of Appleton, um, the Appleton Public Library, and of course, all of the CMS faculty and my cohort who's been really, really amazing. Um, I think I learned, somehow I learned more here uh, than I, I could have possibly imagined, and I'm just extremely grateful to have spent the last two years with you all. Thank you.
like 10 years of working with interactive documentaries, I, I've reached this kind of jaded position where I think the world's divided into two kinds of people. Those who want to move forward and explore and do stuff, and those who don't. They just want to, they just want stuff to happen for them. And so my question to you is about de demographics or personality type, or like is the game of filters that anyone that would engage in this is kind of already inclined to do things and to tinker and play and and this is a great mechanism to kind of direct that and shape it and articulate it. Or is, can, can, can you imagine this reaching people with like would you be game players? Yeah. And it just it actually your last very last comment about you're going to try new change things. It seems to me that that's that was that's really important. Like in a, in a certain way, these are the gamers typically are people that even though they may sit alone are people who are are in fact quite social and and, and quite yeah social in that sense, which means that they can be really useful. So. Um, Yeah, so I think the question is generally uh, about who is this for? Um, and the short answer is uh, I hope to learn that this summer <laughs> as I pilot it. Um, the, the key audiences that I'm targeting are um, people who are already following an organization but maybe aren't very involved. For example, Wisconsin United to Amend has 8,000 people on their uh, mailing list, um, but they have about 20 people who come to meetings regularly. Um, so could we get, uh, maybe this is a way that some of those people would want to engage as opposed to the other ways they've been offering. Um, the second is um, youth uh, creatives, um, so people who maybe are already creating different forms of political art that just haven't been connected to any specific issues. Um, I did a digital engagement survey that also asked a lot of questions about what um, teenagers were, what organizations teenagers were aware of, and it just generally seems that in, um, in this, in the communities that I've been looking at, um, there's just a really big disconnect there. Um, so, it, you know, can we just connect the kids who are already being creative to using that in a way that supports an organization? Um, and then finally, um, the last group is just kids who are, who are already civically engaged, which is a pretty, pretty small group. Um, and this summer, this will be supported through um, partnering with the, with Appleton Downtown, which is like our local, they run the farmer's market and the summer concert series and do a lot of public events. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to help us get more of the public involved. And then also working with the local Boys and Girls Club teen centers. So they'll actually be building play into their days. So I know that I'll at least have some participants who will go through the whole experience. Does that answer it? Yeah, Justin. One of my intellectual fixations right now is thinking about how um, bad guys take all kinds of things that I think are great ideas um, and use them. So like as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking like, so is, is like are the kinds of things you're describing the things that like 8chan is really good at already? Um, sort of mobilizing people through like political activities, like you're subscribed to PewDiePie, sort of along the lines of creative activism that you're describing here. Um, so one so one question is just like at Soy Sense, have you thought that? Are do you think of these as like kind of partisanly neutral tools that can be, you know, deployed by horrible people and equally well by great people? Or is there something baked into your system that was like, no, 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 I'm trying to do this, you know, with, uh, with white nationalism that didn't work at a good point. Um, and then uh, relatedly, I was wondering about the sort of partisanship of the 15 projects that you chose, especially after hearing about the demographics of Appleton. Are these going to be 15 things that, like, pretty much any civically engaged person is reasonably likely to be connected to? Um, are some of them going to be drawn from things that you more associate with Democrats or Republicans? Yeah, okay, so the question is, um, can, could, could this be co-opted for like, nefarious is, purposes? And, already and, and is it already co-opted? Other people already, like bad guys already really good at this. Yeah, so um, I have two, two pieces I, I want to touch on. First is, and it's not necessarily, I don't want to say it's a bad guy, but I did note, I did see an article pretty recently about, I think it was like the Vatican released a Pokemon Go version of like, like following Jesus or finding Jesus or something along those lines. So like the idea of using location-based games for these different like spaces is certainly like possible. Um, in my game, what I've tried to do is, I've gone back and forth on this a lot, but ultimately, um, again, I want to focus on the future as a way to step aside from these partisan barriers. Um, and uh, 
I think I'm going to try to do it in a nonpartisan way, although my hope is that those five issue areas will generally um, only really apply to organizations that are trying to move um, in a more positive direction for everyone. And um, especially given, I think, the state of the Republican Party right now with so many people feeling politically homeless, and that was something that I saw a lot in my, my research last summer, um, I don't want to say it's a progressive thing because I think it's something that uh, people from across the political spectrum might be able to get behind. Um, so yeah, the, the, the goal is to, to be nonpartisan, um, generally organizing around the idea of creating a, a better community in the future. Yeah, that's a great question and something I didn't touch on. So um, like I said, I want to start with about 50 different sort of tutorials on different things you could do that you know, would include, yeah, maybe if you like to knit, this is something. And then there will be, a, in the onboarding process, you'll be able to say, like, I like doing these things. And then it'll give you some initial suggestions. Um, but uh, you can also add those as you level up. Um, and not only can you add tactics, you can also add campaigns and add missions. And um, adding missions, I think, could be a core piece of gameplay that ties into the team component. Um, because the way it works is you, you create the mission, and then you actually get points for um, not only you doing it, but anybody else who does that mission. Um, so it's trying to get people to come up with more creative ways to engage. Um, and part of what I think could be interesting out of this is just creating a big database of all of those possibilities. Um, so yeah, I definitely want it to be something that can expand. All right, thank you.